The views on a breath of fresh air podcast reflects the parties involved, and we encourage you all to use it as a conversational tool that will lead to personal studies of your own. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Welcome to a Breath of Fresh Air podcast. Here with your hosts, Earl Roberts and Nakaz Gay. As a young person, Christianity can be so foggy, like smoke in the mirrors and so unclear. But we're here to bring you a breath of fresh air. A king is what we want. We need a king. King. We need a king. We need a king. King. They're gone. Do you hear what they're saying? They're saying that they want a king. I just can't believe they would reject me like this. After all I've accomplished for them? Samuel, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this very day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Everyone listen up. This is what the Lord has told me concerning your king. This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariot and horses and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvests, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. royalty. The pomp and circumstance of it all, let's be honest, it infatuates us. These were the days that Israel had no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Maybe, just maybe, an earthly king can be the answer to all of Israel's problems. In this week's episode of A Breath of Fresh Air, we are discussing 1 Samuel chapter 7 and 8. As always, be blessed and enjoy. Welcome back to another episode of A Breath of Fresh Air podcast. We appreciate you guys tuning in again of another weekend, or I guess whenever you guys listen. But we definitely appreciate it. Um, right off the top, like the podcast if you like what we're, we're doing. Um, we definitely appreciate all the support. I know I just started to say this a lot, but I mean, you can never say thank you enough. Thank you for everyone who listens. Thank you for sharing it if you're sharing it. Um, thank you for leaving your feedback. If you do commenting under the post, if you do, thank you for the ratings. Just thank you. Like we appreciate the support. We appreciate the love and support. And even the messages throughout the week and the discussions that stem from the podcast, they're all good. And I mean, and, and like, that's the aim of the podcast to start well, to create, to create a, to, re, to create a conversation around it, around the word of God. Um, ironing, sharpening iron, and then for each of us to grow in the faith, because ultimately, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then everything else should be added unto you. So, and then it's just always good to build our relationship with God. So, yeah, definitely appreciate it. Hopefully, everyone had a great week. Um, I know things might be up and down for some people. 
even myself, sometimes we all go through those type of weeks, but definitely hope everyone had a great week. And nonetheless, we know that God has us in his, in the palm of his hands and is keeping us safe and protected and is bringing us through the storm if we're going through a storm. Um, I don't really have a thought for this week, to be honest. I don't know if you have one, cause not to put you on spot. <laughs> Man, so I was just thinking about, I spent a lot of time thinking about Deuteronomy, bro, like Torah, bro, Torah, 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 because um, with... When Jesus was on the earth, you know, that was their textbook at the time. And, mm-hmm. you know, obviously the New Testament is based on Jesus's life and teachings and then everything after that. But and particularly the law, meaning, I mean, just talking about the Ten Commandments. So in Deuteronomy 5, they talk about the Ten Commandments. Then in Deuteronomy 6, they talk about the Shema. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they mention that you should keep these, you should write these on your doorposts, mm-hmm. keep them as a symbol in your, in your, in your, um, I guess, on your forehead and, and in your hands, you know, that's a phrase that we tend to attribute to being in revelation, but it's, it's been mentioned a few times in the Torah. Um, and they also talk about, talk about it when you, when you walk and write this on your doorpost, the overall, <clears throat> the overarching theme is to keep these laws on the front of your mind. And so <clears throat> as we think about, you know, what the guidelines God gave us in order to, you know, be good or to please him, you know, the Ten Commandments. These things, as well as the the entire Bible, we could use the entire Bible in this analogy. These are things that we should be talking about daily. And this is to to your point, you say the spark dialogue, you know, that's kind of the purpose of our podcast. And so let's think about it the way we we should think about the Shema. Um, That's Deuteronomy 6. Let's keep it in our foreheads, in our minds, in our hearts, in, in the work we do. You know, keep these laws, guidelines, stories, etc., in the forefront of our mind, at the front of our conversation, the things that we, quote unquote, obsess, like in a healthy way, the things that we teach our family and friends. Like, this is the way we should look up at the Bible and look at God's law and the way we, and the way to please him, you know, and to be more like him, I should say rather. So, yeah. So basically my thought for the week, um, we spend a lot of time talking about things that we enjoy because obviously it makes us happy, you know, it mm-hmm. entertains us, but we can't have all fun and no work. You know, we can't have all work or all play and no work. You understand? So let's make it also a point to talk about the goodness of God, you know, talk mm-hmm. about the things of the Bible and just make this a, a healthy habit that we practice on a daily that's a good thought, man. And like, and sometimes like people don't even realize they're saying your testimony and passing to someone or just give witnessing about a good thing God has done to you alone can spark the conversation in itself. Like you don't have to come off as, some, I, I don't know. Some people feel, especially when you first start, now some people feel weirded out talking about God. Like they don't want to offend anybody. And then mm-hmm. sometimes I, I used to feel that way too. But I'm like, yo, if God's been good to me, why am I afraid to tell someone that I've been blessed by God? Not mm-hmm. in a braggadocious way, as in a way of the sheer gratitude. Like, you no, know, God has brought me through this storm. I was at a low point and he's brought me through. I didn't know how I was going to make it over this mountain. He's brought me through. And I feel like a lot of people, you shouldn't be scared to talk about how good God has been to you. Mm-hmm. And so I guess just big piggyback off your point, like keeping these things in the forefront of our mind as we go go about like not being scared to talk about God, like actually bringing them up in our conversations. Um, I think it's a really important and something that shouldn't be, we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. Well, I is actually, I, I, I feel the same way. A lot of times, like, let's say I come across a friend and I can't say this happens with all of my friends, but let's say I run into a friend that I haven't seen in a while. You know, I, um, you know, they, they might, they might think about me when I was, wasn't as deep in the faith as now, like when I wasn't as learned as now, not to say I am, but when I was way more ignorant to the Bible and we might have a regular conversation, the same conversation, but it will be burning in me to insert God, Jesus, Bible. It will burn in me because like these things that I consume throughout my day, like, um, but I'd say, no, nah, I ain't do it to him. You understand? Like, I just see you. This is the first time I see you in a while. I ain't overwhelm you. And then I start to feel sad, bro. I, sometimes it's, it's like a grieving in my heart because of the idea that I may be the only person in this person in this person's life who knows God. Because I can't speak for who else they know. I just know me. Mm-hmm. I know I know God. You understand what I'm saying? And so 
sometimes it it it, it kind of makes me sad to think, bro. Are you willing to let this opportunity pass without planting a seed of in any type of way about God and just leave it up to chance that someone else is 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 helping them to you know have, have their religious fix or just to <clears throat> help them understand about God? Like I like sometimes it makes me sad that I'm willing to leave that up to chance for the sake of not making someone uncomfortable. And sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, you know, and when I don't, I have to live with that for the rest of the day mm-hmm. until, you know, until I get some type of relief. But sometimes I feel really sad because you, you just don't know, bro. Like you don't know what your, your testimony, your talking about God, how this could inspire someone. Exactly. Yeah. Or I could just make them feel comfortable, bro. Some people embarrass about God, bro. Some people need, um, a group. Some people need a tribe, bro. Some people don't want to be a leader. I can't be a Christian if it means I's the only one. This is me quoting like like a mindset. I can't be a Christian if I'm the only one being this and everybody going to laugh at me and, you know, treat me like I'm like I'm weird. However, if I see a group of Christian and these people confident and bold in their Christianity, you know, that can inspire others to, to be the same. You know, that that's a testimony for me. I have friends who are not born and raised in the faith for real, bro. Like they Christians in the sense that they believe in Christ, but they don't, they don't practice anything in the Bible. They live a regular life, but at the end of the day, they believe that Christ is God and that's their definition of Christianity. But I have people come to me in the past 12 months telling me I am turning my life completely to Christ, bro. I ain't care what no one got to say. I ain't care what none of my mm-hmm. own friends, no girl, no love interest. And that's a rebuke to me because I was, I was, a practicing Christian, I would say for my whole life, but even some stances I never took as bold as these people. And I like, bro, this person have the confidence and this boosts my confidence. That's how I need to be. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? And so like, <clears throat> with that being said, like we should always try to take advantage of times where we think it's an opportunity to talk about God or talk about Christ. Even if it makes someone uncomfortable, bro, I'd rather tell you your breath stink. If you're going to talk to a girl, then watch you get embarrassed. Bro. I'd rather you be embarrassed in front of me than you be embarrassed in front of that girl or the president or whoever you're going to talk to. You understand what I say? Friends tell Fox. friends when their breath stink, bro. That, that's just what it is, bro. Like mm-hmm. the whole, <clears throat> Sometimes the conversations, bro, is for your own good, even if mm-hmm. it makes you uncomfortable. And so that's we have to consider that. But everything packaged in love. By the way, everything should be packaged in love. <laughs> mm-hmm. Most definitely, most definitely. That's a good thought, though. Appreciate you yeah. actually bringing that up. Man, to that. So this week, we are picking up in Samuel chapter 7. Well, first Samuel 7, because, you know, a long time ago, they decided that Samuel should be divided into two. <laughs> So we are picking up in 1 Samuel 7. Uh, up to this point, last episode, we realized that the ark got returned to Israel because, you know, um, they went to war against the Philistines. Eli's sons, Phineas and what, what, what was the next guy's name? I always mess this up. Uh, Phineas the, and... What is, what is his name, bro? Hophni. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> man. Nah. Off nine, Phineas. Phineas. Anyway, <laughs> Phineas. So off nine, Phine- Phineas. They, you know, took the ark of the god to battle, and as we discussed in the previous episodes, they were treating it more as a trophy, as an idol, than as a sacred re- relic, as you know, God's representation among them. And they got utterly defeated. But we see that God used His own glory to defeat. Dagon, the fish half-like human strat statue. We see them when they put the Ark of the Covenant in Dagon's temple, Dagon fell down. They say, oh, strange coincidence. They picked him back up, put him up. And then the next day he was down and he was like, you know, broken into pieces. And then the Ark of the Covenant went from city to city and started to curse the people. They got some tumors. They got some rats. Um, and it was just a nuisance among them. And so then, then they decided to, you know, they came up with this plan to return the Ark to the Israelites um, we, like I said, we discussed in the previous episode, and so it was kind of an ingenious way. And they say, and essentially, they were saying that if, if this thing is to make it back to the Israelites, their God's gonna have to direct it back because we ain't sending it back directly to them. But if it makes it back, we know it's God's doing. And they also sent with some offerings, you know, to to repent, I guess, to like pay penance for their their transgressions, as they called it. Um, so the ark made it back to Israel, and as 
it went because it came back there. So I think we ended last week's episode with just it kind of showing how instead of Israel being happy and excited that they got their ark back, it, it kind of was like a detriment to them. They were trying to figure like how we how can we even survive with this thing being back in our presence? And it just really goes to show the state of Israel and their mindset and how far they've fallen from God. Kind of echoing the whole thing that we've been doing ever since Judges, really. Just showing how Israel have, how they're on this downward spiral. And so that's kind of where we're picking up back from in 1 Samuel 7. And that's just a backdrop. Definitely check with the previous episodes if, it's, if for some reason it's your first time tuning in to get the context behind this. Um, so, yeah. So in 1 Samuel 7, we did read this in the last episode, but so men from Kirith, Jerem, came and took up the Ark of the Lord. They brought it to Abendadab's house on the hill and consecrated Eleazar, his son, to guard the Ark of the Lord. They remained in Kirath, Jerem, for a long time, 20 years in all. I was supposed to ask you a question because I, I honestly didn't research this, right? But like, were these people in the like Levite line? Like, I mean... You know, I don't know, because <clears throat> when it say Eliezer, just not for a second, for some reason, I thought about Aaron's son. For no, some don't worry. Reason, like, I, I thought it was the same thing. I was like, oh, no. Yeah. I'm like, no, he been dead. <laughs> he been dead. Right. He but, been dead. Yeah, I, I'll, um, I'll Google that in a second, but I, I, I'm not sure. But, I mean, I want to assume, yes, because why else? Like, who else house would you put it in if you know only the Levi should even be touching this thing? You know what I'm saying? I get that, but at the same time, why just not send it back to the temple? Very true. But then guess what? Everybody from that temple just died. Like the daddy and the two, you know, the high priest just died and his two successors just died. So it might have just been a place where it's like, who's gonna be our leader? Because even even in um in this, in this we can see Samuel like transition from boy to manhood and his responsibility. Mm-hmm. So so I feel like I know stay. This might have been the closest place. I don't know. You understand what I'm saying? But it, it might have also been because they didn't really have leadership per se you know, in the temple, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're still in verse two because verse two has a, you know, it changes thought. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so we see the ark remained there for 20 years and all. So that's still a pretty long time that the ark was outside of the temple, just as context. Um, then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, if you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves from the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. So the, Isra- so the Israelites put away their Baals and the Ashtoreths and serve the Lord only. So, I mean, of context, again, we talked about this in previous episodes, but Ashtaroth were like pole-like gods, essentially as idols that they used to worship, mostly made out of wood. And we know the Baals were other statues and idols that they had in the time. So that's just context there. So we see it again. So Samuel's kind of having an altar call, as I would call it, a come back to the Lord moment. Um, guys, and, and to me too, it's like historically, if we look at what is, if we if we looked at our path, you guys have worshipped idols. When you put them away, cry out to God; He forgives you, and things are all as well in the land again. Hmm. So now we see in Samuel, essentially pulling back what we've heard several times in Judges: put away your idols and serve the Lord only. And then so in verse five, then Samuel said, assemble all Israel in Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. And when they assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day, they fasted and there they confessed. We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as leader of Israel. And we can see also he was, if you look and read the footnote, Samuel was a judge. So you can see he's officially, he's grown up now also serving as like the priest and a judge of Israel. Yeah. And so I just did a quick Google search. Uh-huh. It is widely believed that he is, he was a Levite is a Jewish historian. I've read one of his books before. His name is um, Flavius Josephus. He mm-hmm. um, named Abinadab as a Levite. Okay. And so take that as you will. It's not the Bible. You understand, but it's a Jewish historian. And so, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, 
Where was I? For seven. Um, Bing. So the fam- so the <laughs> family. So when the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled in Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up and attacked them. When the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, "Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us. Oh no, He's your God, mm-hmm. that He may <laughs> that He may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines." Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day, the Lord thundered with a loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The Mm. men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below beth Then Samuel took a stone and set up between Mizpah and Shen. He named the place Ebenezer. Thus saying, saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were, substu- were subdued and they stopped invading Israel's territory throughout Samuel's lifetime. At the hand of the Lord, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to Israel. That is interesting. Very right? interesting. Yeah, we're going to bring that back up later on mm-hmm. in Samuel. But as <laughs> Israel delivered the neighboring territory from the hands of the Philistines, and there was peace between the Israel and the Amorites. Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. From year to year, he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. But he was always went back to Ramah, where his home was. And there he was... And, and There he also held court for Israel and he built an altar to the Lord. So this is the end of verse seven, but a couple of things I just want to like discuss and just show how like the, like the differences between like Eli and I guess Samuel right here in itself. Mm -hmm. Um, We see like, what was it? Three chapters, two chapters ago when the Israelites decided to go to war against the Philistines. And I think we mentioned this in that, in that episode, like, why didn't you guys just consult God or try to have someone, one of you guys religiously to speak up and try to consult God, pray for the people, see, like, try to offer some words of, like, some words of advice, some heavenly advice, someone at least try to consult God. And, like, no one did it. They got beat. They came back for the ark, still didn't consult God. Eli let them take the ark. Um, and they got beat even worse. And the ark got stolen. But now we see, I sometime later, because the Bible doesn't give a definitive time when this does happen. Um, but we see sometime later, you guys, I guess, remembered the playbook, like Samuel to come back off and dust off a playbook. Like, I mean, I know not all our listeners like watch sports or follow sports, right? But at a certain time, like sometimes during the season, a team loses their identity. And so sometimes you have to go back to the drawing board and be like, hold on, what worked for us in the beginning of the season? We need to go back to that. If it's basketball, they might have a good pick and roll. They might have a good defense. Football, they might have a good running attack. They might have a good throwing attack, or they might have a good defense as well. They're like, hold on, we need to do that because that works. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, that works. So we see Samuel Kim and guess what, guys? Oh, you're worshiping idols. Guess what? <laughs> this never works. Mm-mm. This Gotta go. never works. So your bales and your asteroids, put those away. And again, and so now we see again, if we even go back down to like when verse seven, oh no, what was it? Uh, verse 10. We see the Lord fought the battle for the Israelites and they didn't have to do anything. I mean, they still went back and after God did like clean up duty or whatever. But God heard Samuel's prayer, accepted their offering and their sacrifice. And he himself was enough to deal with the Philistines. The Philistines were already in panic from just the thunder. And like, I mean, I could imagine this God sending down thunder and lightning. So who knows the, <laughs> the sheer chaos and the oh, yeah. Yeah, panic level that would have instilled in someone. But I mean, it, again, like we see the old playbook never fails. And to Kazi's point, that we have this over and over again, the idols is the problem here. And we see God never indulges in idol worship, never condones it. 
he hates it. <laughs> Straight up, he hates it, bro. And so <clears throat> we can see Ashtaroth, that's the female idol. And then you have Baal, plural. And uh, they, these are plural, the female idols and, and maid idols. And so, like, my just thing is, dog, just to be completely frank, like, if you ever read the Old Testament, even if you read up to this point, even if you read up to Judges, you know, quite frankly, God just does not approve of idols. And then, you know, if even, even before that, if you get, if you, you can't leave Exodus without knowing God don't approve of idols. Like you can't, you can't get, but when you get to Exodus 20, mm-hmm. you know, God say, don't have any other gods before me. Don't make yourself a graven image. Then he go into this long thing about who he's visit people of the six and seven generation of them mm-hmm. that hate him. You know what I'm saying? And he's saying, bro, I ain't, I don't forget these things, bro. If seven generations of people worshiping idols, bro, that, bro, I am not forgetting that. You understand what I'm saying? And somehow the Israelites still do it. Like, and <laughs> you can't say, uh, spoiler alert, we can't say that this is going to end in Samuel because, Mercy. you know, f- for the rest of the Bible, well, for the rest of the Old Testament, you see this is, this is a struggle with the Israelites. But the fox of the fox, bro, like, it is not a successful method. Worshiping idols is turning away from God. And God talks about that, bro. It's like, he, in, in when you read some of the prophets, God equates that to you being with an adulterous woman. You understand what I'm saying? You, you, I am your first wife or your first bride but you cheat on me with somebody or, or the other way around you are my bride but you all leave me for somebody else you know you leave me for somebody else that only mm-hmm. causes you, you 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 chaos and then if you tell me if you do this long enough you tell me that you want to worship these these idols i can give you over to the people who make these idols because you are their servants and that's what you're telling them that you want to be like theoretically that's what you're saying from a spiritual perspective you're saying bro i worship in the gods and so I ain't trusting in my God. So my God, God is now saying, bro, like, if this is what you really want, okay, you don't have my protection anymore, you know? And since you want to be the servant of these gods, you're going to be the servants of those who make the gods because what is greater, bro, the creator or the, or the, or the created? You understand? Mm. That's why when we when we as human beings talk about, talk about oh, we are gods and da-da-da-da, bro, that's, it's a playful thing, bro. But when, when it's not like you serious, that's when I got a, that's when I got a bark bark. You know, because it's certain times in the Bible where they say we are gods, but it's always with a small G. You understand what I'm saying? It's always with a small G, but it's never saying that we have power in and of ourselves. And this is something that we have always seen up until this point, the Israelite army, when they win victories, they are a feature. You know, when you have a song, right? You mm-hmm. have the main artist. You could have Earl featuring the cards. You know, it's Earl's song. Earl probably doing all the heavy work. And I only have a small section of this song that I'm doing. That's, That's for how reference. It- It'll never be that way. <laughs> <laughs> I still got that one song you record, bro. But don't worry. That's no, safe. No, no, never no, see never the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> it's safe on a hard drive somewhere. But anyway. <laughs> but that's, that's like... And it's barely even a collaborative effort, right? You have you have the walls of Jericho, you mm-hmm. blow a trumpet, all the walls come crumbling down, and the people melted fair. Bro, this is a gimme at this point, bro. It's like God gives you gives you the um the the war on a silver platter. You know, mm-hmm. when you're always fighting at AI, all type of hornets and then come in, when you're always even <clears throat> even the Philistines, I'm I'm sure the um the ark was not returned like i don't i'm not i don't think this was the same time frame it, it had to have been some some years i passed but the philistines just now they had to they had to concede to god because they was attacked with rodents and tumors we serve a god who has supernatural power we serve a god who created everything so he have he has power over everything nature every single thing and, and so when when it when it comes to war he don't leave you empty-handed as a matter of fact, it ain't even fair fighting against the Most High God. Because he coming with thunder, he coming with hail, he coming with hornets. You understand what I'm saying? He coming with lightning, he, he making people afraid. You don't even have to confidence. Y'all could be over, y'all could be outmatched. Y'all could be outnumbered. We see that with, um, I'm going to call him Jared Bale, Gideon, right? We see that with Gideon, completely outmatched. It's 300 to like 100,000. You mm-hmm. understand what I'm saying? But they fed 300 people because of the power of God. And so um, in, in terms of like Jewish history or like Israelite history, in terms of war, when you have a leader like Samuel, you have somebody who saying, I am dedicated to God, you know, and I'm going to make sure that we serve God the correct way. We see how God 
how how everyone is on one accord. When we get away with um when we when we turn away from we as Israelites, just talking from the perspective of Israelites, mm-hmm. when we turn away from the foreign gods and we cry unto the Lord, the Lord then turns his his anger or his hand away from uh, his hand of punishment away from us, and now he helps us. We, the Israelites all through the book of Judges, they cry out to God, and God heard them and rose up a judge to um to expel the I don't know the enemies from the town. And that's exactly what Samuel is doing in the chapter. So um the footnote was 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 justified in calling him a judge because this is essentially what the judges were supposed to do. Like, so if you are, if you had a, a judge who did its job correctly, it was this, it expelled the land of um, idols and it also cleaned it, the, the land up from its enemies. And that's what we see in um, chapter seven. But it's good you said that because that was going to be my next point. That was a perfect segue. Like yeah. episode 69, we, <laughs> we literally did a judges recap episode. We like, you know, we ran back through the book of judges and we started to like rank the judges. So I gave them letter grades. <laughs> yeah. But if we look at what a judge was supposed to do in the very essence of it, Samuel was a really good judge. And then again, we see in like in verse 15, he ended out like on a high note too. Like all the other judges, most of the other judges, they didn't like from Gideon down, it wasn't really good. Like nope. everyone had they one high light and then it was just no a precipitous filler. <laughs> it was like it was just a downhill <laughs> spiral. Yeah. But even though, even given the state of Israel, like Kazi said, like, okay, he was a good religious leader. And then a the next thing too, with all the other judges we see, like they just set up shop in that one city and they wasn't like, they wasn't really going throughout Israel. From what I, from what I read, from the context the Bible gave me, I, I never see it, but here we see the Bible even explicitly say that he went from, he had a circuit. This man was literally going from town to town and probably all the other, all the other towns in between, literally judging Israel, like going through, hearing out the problem, settling disputes. And again, he was still also there spiritually at this time too. So offering sacrifices as he go. And he still has his own home base too, like where his original, like, you know, setup was. So he was a really good judge going through Israel, hearing out their problems. And then he wasn't really a military man either. And then we see this man as a man of peace. Think about this, the priest, but y'all conquering territories back that y'all didn't do. I ain't never had one in the other judges that was conquering other territories. Y'all just mm-hmm. trying to fight the people out of y'all own town. Yep. Y'all trying to liberate y'all selves. The right. priest got y'all conquering foreign lands again and also brokering peace treaties with the Amorites. Like, hey, guys, yo, for like the next 80 years, could we not do this? Like, right. Like, <laughs> you see the blueprint now. Let's just follow this, please. Exactly. So to me, that's just powerful. Like, Samuel not only was a high priest, I mean, I feel like that alone is a lot to like to juggle, but also you still judge in Israel as you go along and you're actually doing a pretty decent job of it. And then you actually staying close to the Lord and actually providing guidance and wisdom. I mean, cause like, I like how the, I, 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 the reason why I kind of like and appreciate chapter seven right now, just going through it again is like, cause think about we in chapter seven, we still got the rest of first Samuel to go. And we got a whole second, a, a second Samuel book. So we got like a lot of more Samuel left, but this gives you the, out, like, like, I guess the, this is, this is essentially what uh, Judges chapter two was, an overview of his life. Like, we're going to get into more details of Samuel and we're going to introduce some other more important characters from this point on. But if you want to know who Samuel was, it's like the conclusion of Samuel itself. Like, hey, this guy was a good guy. All the rest of his life, he continued to be Israel's leader and he continued to serve God con- continually. He went throughout the line of Israel, ministering, selling disputes and being a good, decent judge towards people. And... And you see, he had his own altar built to the Lord. Like Samuel was the judge that the other judges should have been up to this point. So I kind of really like that context that this paints. And, and so now watch this, right? We talk about, now I know if this is a reach or not, but I just want to show a, a similarity. Mm-hmm. We talk about Melchizedek, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it asked in during Genesis. And I must admit, when you keep talking about Melchizedek, I'm like, but why are it's ch- ch- but there's so much random people in the Bible? I like, but why are we hounding in on Melchizedek? For I don't I don't get it. But um <laughs> the truth comes out. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was like, but why are you being such an emphasis on this one guy? But the story is about Abraham. But Melchizedek <laughs> is a type, you know, meaning that he is a foreshadowing of Jesus, who Jesus is considered an anti-type and Type is anything that foreshadows Jesus in the Old Testament. So we have Melchizedek, who is the king of Jerusalem. 
Mm-hmm. It's the first time they, I think it's the first time they even mentioned Jerusalem is in Genesis. Um, and he was a priest, but he was also a king. You know, Jesus being the anti-type, he's a priest and a king at the same time. You know, so this was just kind of like a, a, a foreshadowing to Jesus. We have another guy who falls into that category, but we so close to his story. I ain't even going to mention mm-hmm. it right now. But um, um, when you look at Samuel, 1 Samuel 2.26, and, and, and we mentioned this on the part, but just to read it. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people, right? Cross reference that to Luke 2 52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So it's a direct parallel right here. So this is also a type. And that's why I say it could be a reach, but I'm showing you just a parallel. Mm-hmm. The first time we hear about someone growing in stature and in favor with God and man was Samuel, right? This was this priest who was getting visions from a young boy, right? And now in Samuel chapter seven, we understand that he he restored peace and order into the land. He get people closer to God and he rid the land of idols. So we, we look at this as a, as a righteous and just man. And even moving forward, when we see his relationship with God, we know these are this is true. And so I'm saying the same thing. I'm saying that we can see that Samuel's life was the type of life that Christ had, or maybe the opposite way. I don't know which, I don't I don't mean to be irreverent, but all I'm saying is we have somebody who's a priest and who is also a leader, right? And who is trying to save people in the literal sense. He's saving the lives of people, but he's also saving the salvation of people in terms of getting rid of idols and stuff like that. So I just wanted to make that comparison, mm-hmm. an Old Testament comparison of priest slash leader who does this. And then we see Jesus, who was the ultimate, um, he was the ultimate final person God being that is a priest of all of us. I'm just trying to be politically correct, bro. No, I know. I'm like, this man, you're trying hard right now. Uh, you say, you say, you say Jesus as a person, probably like, no, but he's a God. And they're like, all right, bro, you get what I, you get what I try to say, really. So anyway, um, Jesus is our ultimate priest, but he, and he's also the King of Kings, Lord of Lords as well. You know, so we see Samuel as, as, as just a human representation of a priest leader as well. Definitely. So, man, to me, that was a good, that was a good and like valid comparison in my eyes because we was talking about this before. I think it's definitely off part. I can't remember if we say it on part. At this point, <laughs> we don't have like over 75 episodes. Like it really kind of, I, 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 it's kind of hard to keep track on what we did and did not say on the part sometimes. Mm. So some stories, I'm sure y'all heard this before, but you know what? If you're a regular listener, appreciate it. But... <laughs> So, and, and to me, when I heard this the first time, it, it kind of struck me. But like, if you ask someone typically, like, who's your favorite character in the Bible? Ironically, a lot of people don't say Jesus. And it's not because they don't appreciate Jesus. It's not because they don't love Jesus, right? It's because, and I know we definitely talked about this before, but it's, it's yeah. because like people think about like, oh, David was this. or Moses was such a like powerful leader. Or Abraham this. But then all of these people have qualities of Jesus. And Jesus was like the perfect embodiment of everyone's traits that it doesn't mm. stand out. Because, like, I mean, growing up, who was your favorite Bible character? I mean, I would, and, and it's, it's weird, but like, if you, ask, if you ask a typical child who their favorite Bible character is, I would, I would offer a friendly wager that <laughs> eight, out of ten, eight, eight out of 10 of them would say someone other than Jesus. Because some people probably would still say Jesus, so I ain't taking that away. But I feel like a majority of them, even six out of 10, I feel like more people, more, more kids than not would say David or Samson or. Daniel or something, Joshua, like, like all the other characters of the Bible, except Jesus, but it's like, Jesus was so perfect. And he had all of these witty responses and all these other traits, but people just don't glorify it as much, which is interesting. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Cause I, I, I remember talking about this on point and I remember it not being Jesus. And I remember saying, Oh, that's because Jesus, da, 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 right. But even now, bro, I don't even know who my favorite person is. But that's to say that it wouldn't just pop out and say, yeah, Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? Exactly. But, because like if I, someone catch me on spot, I might say Paul, bro. Because <laughs> I talk about yeah. Paul so much even on the point. I was a fuck. I yeah. always bring in a Paul. Like mm-hmm. I might say Paul. And I'd be like, huh? I'd be like, yeah, bro, because Paul, you know, did this and this. He was captured yeah. and still had this. He was like in the jail and stayed in jail. because I'm like, bro, but. It should be Jesus, not, this, not not the one who come to keep to save to save to save you to save you to die for your sins, not him. Exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, noted. <laughs> but yeah, that's funny. <laughs> but yeah, oh. definitely. And and um, so now I and you know this, bro. I just had a conversation with somebody that believes in the Tanakh. 
AKA the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. but they don't believe, I don't think they even believe Jesus exists, you know, born and raised Christian. And interesting conversation we had, you know. And so now when I read the Old Testament, bro, I just look for blatantly obvious things that point to Jesus, you know? And so that's what my eyes open to now. So like, even when I'm seeing things, I'm like, bro, that's just like Jesus. That's just like Jesus. And the fox are the fox, bro. A lot of these people are typified versions of Jesus, bro. Because, you know, everyone, we always say God is good, you know, because we talk about the goodness of God, right? But I heard someone say good is God. Not that good is a God, but goodness is of God. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? And so these people who are godly men, Obviously, they have traits of God. And so when God comes in the flesh, bro, in person, you have no choice but to see the similarities between them because it was him, it was Jesus that inspired all of these people to be like this or taught these people to be like this anyway. And so there should be types. You understand what I'm saying? That point to Jesus. You know what the question... So if you're listening on Spotify right now, right, there's probably going to be a question in this episode. The question will be like, who is your favorite Bible character? Answer it. I feel like a lot of a lot of people are gonna cop out and say Jesus. But no, because we say like, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> honestly, answer who is your favorite Bible character. And if you feel like type an extra, say why. I just actually make a note for it to actually make that the question this episode. But definitely, so definitely cool. check that out, guys. And also, if you listen on YouTube, that comment who's your favorite Bible character as well, or, or also any other notes that you feel like compelled so far from this episode, or anything else we're going to talk about. So as a transition to uh, chapter eight of first Samuel, I just want to read the last line of Judges 21, Judges chapter 21, in the his last line on Judges, period. Yeah. In those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. And we see in Ruth, we kind of, at the end, we kind of saw a foreshadowing. But now in Samuel 8, we're going to start attacking this problem a little bit more head on. And from this point on in the Bible, we're going to start, you know, dealing with this concept. Every, Israel didn't have a king and everyone did as they saw fit. And we're going to see the repercussions of this. We're going to see um, what this meant for Israel going forward. What I was supposed to pull up, but I mean, I probably still kill it. I'm probably not going to do it right now. But it was like this stuff in Deuteronomy when they said, like, if you had a king, he's supposed to be fit like these criteria. Mm-hmm. Like, I, like, I literally just remembered it again. But... Um, I'm going to start reading. So in 1 Samuel 8, when Samuel grew old, so we see he was a little bit older now, he appointed his sons as Israel leaders. The name of his sons were, the name of, the name of, the name of his firstborn was Joel, or Joel, and the name of his second son was Abijah. <clears throat> and they served at Beersheba. But his two sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest scheme and accepted bribes and perverted justice. And so I wouldn't say, because we know when we talked about Hophni and Phinehas, they were described as pure scoundrels. Mm -hmm. But we see Samuel's sons had a perverted sense of justice and they didn't fall exactly. They weren't as God-fearing as Samuel. And... (laughs) See, right now, it's like, I feel bad for you. I know we went super hard on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in but all no, fairness, right? Are you just going to say something? No, no, no. Go on. Finish your point. I think we better land on, on the same place. I mean, so it's like, okay, we know Samuel was better than Eli when it comes to judging and leading Israel. But at the same time, it's like, your sons have their own minds, but I'm sure you tried. But at the same time, like, I don't know what his sons really got into. I don't right. know what you was going to say. So let me tell you, let me tell you. All right. So it's it kind of hard because we just, we just big Samuel up. We like, yeah, yeah, you boy, he's a good guy. He's a righteous guy. Then we see his sons, you know, they were sacrilegious, you know, it's reminiscent of Hophni and Phinehas, but it's also reminiscent of Nadab and Abihu. So this is a common theme right now. You have high priests, two sons who are wicked, I'll say. God mm-hmm. killed Nadab and Abihu. Boom, in the fire. They use, they was probably drunk and they use a reverent fire or like unsacred fire and they burned up, right? This was in numbers, I think. And so we see in the beginning of Samuel, half nine Phineas, they scoundrels, you know, they stealing, they sleeping with the ladies at the tent of the meeting, right? And this was, they were the sons of the high priest as well. And 
God held Eli accountable for them, right? And so now we see Samuel's sons are also dishonest or they, they, they have a perverted sense of justice, but Samuel is not held accountable for that. You understand what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, you could you could do everything that you wanted. You could, bro, you could, it's plenty of stuff I do in life, right? Mommy, teach me better than bro. You mm-hmm. understand what I'm saying? And I make this decision on my own. You understand? And so my thing is, I only, I don't know if I, I don't know if we, if we quote unquote casted blame on Aaron when his sons did that. But I know we cast blame on, on Eli because Eli was literally punished for mm-hmm. the way his sons was, was carrying on. So we know that Eli was an accomplice in that, whether he agreed with their lifestyle or not, the way he acted towards them, it enabled them. And so now we don't have the same evidence that Sam, Samuel enabled his sons. It's a lot. Of, oh, for oh, let's, let's, let's finish it off first. It's a lot of people, AKA PKs. That's what, that's what a lot of people call them. I never heard that term in, in, in the Bahamas, but in America, they say pastors, kids, PKs. A lot of times you see PKs, bro, and sometimes they misunderstood. Sometimes they are rude. You know, sometimes they are promiscuous. It's a it's a bad rap the name PK gets, right? But I I try to meet I try to meet people like that with grace because when you really think about it, right? If you have somebody who's a godly person and this person rock solid, mm-hmm. you can't get to this person. <laughs> I solemnly believe the enemy will try to attack the people around them, to discredit them. So now if, if me if me and my family, we, we exemplify godly traits and you can't find no flaw in me or my wife, but my children who's still young in the faith, you could get them, you could pair pressure them to do X, Y, Z. People looking at that and they might say, well, Nikaz ain't really who he say he is because look at what his son doing, his son on drugs. You understand? His son doing the X, Y, Z. You know, that's, these are the snares of the enemy as well. You know, yeah. Sometimes you gotta really think about how, by the good, by the devil might not have bring out his best, his best attacks on me. I might have been easy work. The devil might do one little thing, and I fall for the temptation. But you, you, like when I think about people who are leaders, you know, the devil might bring out his big guns for them. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, if I could get the leader to fall, like if I could get his children to fall, I have a bigger impact because they have a bigger following. They they lead people to Christ on a weekly, you know. And so that's what I think about in this scenario. And you could argue, oh, where was this energy for Eli and, and for, for Aaron? I could tell you specifically, Eli was an accomplice in his sons. That's why Eli died on the same day as his sons. And God prophesied that twice. So we know that Eli was an accomplice. Can't say the same for Samuel. I was going to ask a question because like this is the first instance where we see that a judge tried to like pass down his judgeship, I guess, to his sons. I was like, do you think like someone was wrong for that? Because we know like God essentially raised up a judge each time. Uh-huh. So I'm like, do you think it was like him being overly zealous in that aspect? So the thing about it is Samuel probably was the high priest. <laughs> and so his, his sons would have, let's say, let's say high priest yeah. or not. He was a priest. So his sons were in the priestly line. So they were supposed to be priests regardless. <coughs> now for them to be the completely leader, the complete leader of Israel, that I don't know because... You see, that part, all, that's the part I, we're talking more about right now, yeah. Yeah, because we we know that God raised up these judges. But a lot of times God raised up the judges because Israel gone so far. We don't even know much, but we know we know about... um, um I keep calling them Jeroboam, Gideon's sons. Gideon's children, because Gideon didn't want to be king. And his sons were saying, no, we ain't going to be king. You understand what I'm saying? But it was one who decided to be king. That's the, that's one of the, all the few judges who they, they even talk about their children for real, for real, in terms mm-hmm. of succession. And He's so I don't know. Deep end. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it might have been wrong, because guess what? If, if Samuel trying to push his sons to be kings, all of Israel can look at them and say, bro, but ain't no way y'all leading us, because y'all ain't like Samuel. And we kind of see that's what happened. Right. And the way the way the Bible described them, why would you want? So you remember, like, like how you say Deuteronomy, right? We was, we was talking about what a king should have, right? Mm-hmm. One of the things of a leader is a leader can't take bribes. That's in the Torah. You shouldn't take bribes if you're a leader. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? These people, they was taking bribes. They wasn't even leaders. I mean, they wasn't even like overall leaders. You know, but they're taking bribes. These was perverted men, like. You feel me? So I can see Israel saying that uh, 
I can't, when Samuel go, I can't trust Samuel to send in the leaders to be Samuel. Because these people, they ain't making sense. And they're, and they're far to right here today and they ain't making sense. That's why I personally, I don't even know why. Um, anyway, I can just let, let the story go on before I even really give my opinion on that. Um, so we see the elders gathered at uh, gathered together and came to Samuel, Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your son do not follow in your ways. So now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. And I'm going to keep it going. But when they said, but when, but when they, but when they said, God, when they, <laughs> my bad. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this is please Samuel. So we pray to the Lord and the Lord told him, Listen to all the people, listen to all that the people are telling you. It is not that they have rejected you, but they have rejected me as their mm. king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve him, serve, make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be performers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your green and of your vintage and give it to his official and attendants, your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys. He will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out from, from you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight in our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. I really don't think this, that last line was should have been in this chapter. I think it should have been in the other chapter, but that's just my personal thoughts because <laughs> it goes well with the other chapter. But um, yeah, you want to kick it off this part? I just yeah, so, to- yeah, so Deuteronomy 16 verse 19, and, and this piggybacking on what I was saying earlier, oh, 18 and 19, um, you are to appoint judges and officials for your tribes in every town that the Lord your God has given you. They are to judge the people with righteous judgment. Do not deny justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. So these people were going to be judges one day, but they they um disobeyed Deuteronomy 16 which is talking specifically about bribes. So mm-hmm. I feel like, I feel like the, the elders and everyone in the town, they've justified and saying, bro, <laughs> I don't want these. I don't want these guys. You want to die soon, bro. We can't trust these guys to lead us. You understand what I'm saying? But the problem is when they ask them for a king, a specifically like the term king, it's a lot of things that come with that. And that's what Samuel was trying to show you. Bro, I'm a judge, bro. I am a, I am a priest. Like I, like, And that's what we said in the book of Judges. We, we recognized that they're supposed to be a spiritual leader in some type of way. And then they were a military leader. They wanted, they wanted really a military leader that they could be proud of. And they could like kind of, <laughs> excuse me, compare and brag about because it's, it's majesty that comes with being a king. Sam, Samuel is not described as being rich or flamboyant or glamorous in any type of thing. They saying, bro, I, we had the, we had the perfect, the perfect leader, but now we want that royalty type of thing. And this is specifically to be able to compare to the other nations. Cause they saying they want a King like the other nations. So now this whole time God spent from the Torah straight to judges 
straight to now. He spent all of that time, there's hundreds of years, showing y'all, bro, y'all need to be like other people. When y'all get in this line, don't try to be like them. You understand what I'm saying? Don't do X, Y, and Z. But God, even in his infinite wisdom, he was he knew that there would be a time and people would say, we want a king. That's why in Deuteronomy 16 and 17, 16 is talking, well, most of, most of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, they talk about how to lead and civil laws and stuff like that. But Deuteronomy 17, it mentions the things that a king should have. And one of the things is a king should follow the Torah. And, and that's going to be important as we, for the rest of this book, for the rest of first and second Samuels, and first and second Kings and first and second Chronicles. Chronicles yep. Bro, the, the, the Deuteronomy specifically is going to be thoroughly important. Like just the Torah in general is going to be very important to see um, the way people desecrated God's law. But the thing I'm confused is, I don't understand why Samuel take that personally uh, saying they rejected me. I believe Samuel was saying after this good job I do, they turn around and saying they want a king. Like to me, that might that might have made me feel like he do bad. I wasn't. I, I think it was just a more of a prideful thing because, like, I appointed my sons, and I already because yeah, because remember they ain't really saying there was Samuel in them. They saying mm-hmm. after you, we ain't want your sons, but you just appoint your sons. So now he, I think it's him saying, bro, why are y'all rejecting my son? So I think it's more like that personal family connection. Even though he, they probably know he was doing foolishness. I think. I think. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think that's a slight he feel. Of yeah. like, you know, you you trying to you trying to elevate your sons, like you know, you know, you give a family member something good. But they messing up and all people was like, bro, this this can't, well, we, we gotta move so and so from this position because they ain't messing, but you kind of feel kind of bog. It's like, bro, what you mean? Yeah, because cause watch this, right? They ain't saying that they don't want your son as judges, you know. They saying they don't want your son as judges and they don't want a judge, period. We want a king now, bro. Mm-hmm. Like, like just scratch that whole judge thing, but we want a kingdom now. You feel me? And so it's like it's something to say, like when you was the last of something, and, and then they discontinued that thing. Let's say you was the last engineer, right? And when you go on, they're like, all right, we stop in the engineer program, bro. It's, it's it's a little weird to think about it like that. You feel me? Like, yeah, but even going back off of your other points, right? Um, they want they want a king now. They want to be like the other nations, and it's. And you said something that's pretty powerful. Like when they was when it, when God gave them Canaan to conquer, He simply said, "Do not be like the other nations." Mm. And it's powerful again because you guys want a king. You want a king to go before you and fight in your battles. But as we said in this very same episode, and I love what we have both night and day when it came to Samuel and everything in the same episode. But we have where God just fought a battle for you. We have countless examples where God has been fighting your battles. Your king has been fighting your battles. You want to be like every other nation, but what got you so far at this point was not being like every other nation. Having an all-powerful God that have that has all these other nations in fear, that they respect your God, even when you don't even respect your God, where your God can still be shining and reigning supreme over their gods when your Ark of the Covenant got captured into their territory. But no, you guys want to be like these other nations with a political system with uh, different rules and laws governing. Whereas you guys already had, I wouldn't say the, uh, I, 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 you guys had a, you guys had a perfect system set up by God to show your, to show, to show your country should be governed. But you guys decided not to follow God and you started to follow your own understanding and things started to fall apart. So now in your own thinking, you think, what would be better? Oh, the Philistines of a king. The Amorites of a king, the Ammonites of a king, the Hittites of a king, they seem pretty stable. You know what we're missing? We're missing a king. Mm. So when they actually do feel that they need to rise up against us, we have a king who was commanding the army and we'd always be ready. Mm. No, God is your king. And he already told you guys how to <laughs> think about it. If y'all just would stop following us this whole time. <laughs> y'all never even have any more things to be worried about because God would always have been on y'all's side. He would never forsaken y'all. But now, why it's so, because, and, and here's the reason why God told someone to even take it personally, like, yo, they forsaken me. Because guess what? I am their king and indirectly telling me I ain't good enough for them. That's right. how I'm reading this. Right. I ain't good enough for you guys. That you guys say, we need a physical representation <clears throat> as a king because I am not cutting it. I am not good enough. All the miracles and wonders and works I've been doing, I'm not good enough. I see you got something. I, I think I think it was last week or the week before one of the things we were saying was it, it was one of our beginning thoughts, right? When we was kind of talking about giving something over to God. And I was trying to make a point to say like, 
a lot of times we say we're giving something to God, but we don't want to give it to God because it's like it take away the work that we could do to, to, to solve our own problems in a way. I don't know if I made a good point or not or not, but this reminds me of that. Mm-hmm. So we have a situation where the Philistines were a snare to our state, to feed us, they mock us, they, you know, they take our line, right? So that's embarrassing. They can play anybody who takes something. Imagine someone take your chain, bro, and they wearing it every day, bro. That's disrespectful, bro. Someone take your line and they eating your mangoes and then what you what you farm and you plant yourself, you know, it's embarrassing. And so y'all pray to God and y'all pray hard. And and in verse seven, chapter seven, they make sure they say, they tell Samuel, pray again. You know, he had these sacrifices, suckling lamb and mm-hmm. and when it was time to for battle. Philistine, the Philistines were defeated. But who defeated the Philistines? God. You understand? It wasn't that the Israelites, it, it, we didn't get revenge. You know, like it's something unsatisfying about that. When you when you have to keep put things in God's hands, bro. So a lot of people, like in terms of pride, bro, it's it's not your pride isn't satisfied because I didn't get to do the work. And that's where the disconnect would be. Because like as Christians, every one of us should be submitting to God. You know, I know a lot of men, they always argue, they always force the point. Wives should submit to your husband, should submit, submit, submit. They want, they want, they want to press the issue to say the woman should submit to mine. Are you submitting to God? You understand what I'm saying? You're supposed to be submitting already to God. You understand what I'm saying? Like, and that's and that's for everybody, every human mm-hmm. being, especially Christians, submit, submit, submit. But here it is. We want a king. Because we want to be able to to reap the benefits of the victory. We want to be able to boast and say, our king, ride out, defeat all his enemies. This is our king. So we, so now they have a a stake in this victory. When you have a victory because of hailstorms and because of plagues and stuff like that, you can't even argue that you do that. It's only God who do that. And so they, they turn around and say, bro, even though this is, (laughs) even though this is fully effective, we don't want to go that route. And why is that? We want to be like the other nations. We want to march up. I want to say my king was stronger than your king. Defeat your king. And so like to me, what I'm getting from this is like, it's like a power thing, bro. Like they want to, they want to have more control over the situation. You can't control God. You can't even reason to God. Samuel, you have to reason to God through Samuel. You understand what I'm saying? But now if we have a king, we, we have more control. But Samuel trying to show them it's the opposite, bro. You get a king. The freedoms that y'all have now, y'all have to submit that to the king. The money that y'all have now, or, or the property in the land, mm-hmm. you have to now give that to the king. Your wives, your daughters and stuff, they could do whatever work they doing today. No, they could be working for the king. And I was wondering the other day, like, I wonder if, like, people who work in the palace used to get paid, like, they used to get a wage. Or was it that all of their... um all of their needs were taken care of. Like you have a place to stay and you have food and things like that. But I just, I just wonder like back in these days, did they get a salary? You know what I'm saying? But the fact of the matter is the liberties that y'all have now, y'all will not have because of the king, you know? And so mm-hmm. Samuel, I don't think, so. I, I understand Samuel feeling hurt because he he suggests this people and his his people and they say, no, we mean Garam, but now we want something else. But at the end of the day, they really are rejecting God. Because everything they want out of this king, God was already providing for them. Exactly. And then my next thing too is like, okay, if God already know this is going to be a detriment to the nation, why is he letting it happen? But again, you got to remember, we have a free will. We have choice. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, even we look back at the Egypt story, Pharaoh was so locked in his heart. He was so resolute with what he wanted to do, which was not let the Israelites go. That God was like, okay, cool. You're going to suffer the consequences of your actions. Mm-hmm. And here we've seen essentially the same theme, you know, it's kind of in reverse, but no, the Israelites really want a king. And it's, this, this, to me, this is more similar to Balaam. Balaam really wanted to go to curse the Israelites because mm-hmm. he really wanted the money. Yep. He knew it wasn't right. He knew the consequences might have come with that, but he still wanted to go. And God, after God told him no, he was like, God said, yeah, okay, then go. And now we've seen a similar thing with them. You've seen the Lord told Simon, like, they're rejecting me. Mm-hmm. I know they're rejecting me. But they're so set in their ways in the rejection of me. Let them do it. Listen to them. You know it's bad. I know what's coming. You already laid out the consequences before them. And they're doubling down. No, we want a king to rule over us. So listen to them. They're set in their ways. They already made their choice. And they're resolute in their choice. And they aren't changing their mind in their choices. So now, 
again, like, like people like want their cake and eat it too. Like you want God to like do everything right for you. But then if God takes away your free will, oh, that is in love. God's saying, okay, you have your free will. You have your choice. And you're exercising your choice. I wouldn't be an awesome God if I'm not respecting your choice at this point. Like you are choosing consciously that you want a king, even though you fully understand. <laughs> it's like, I'm giving you the warning of what's going to happen. You guys know what's going to happen. And you're consciously saying, we want this. You heard this and you didn't even, you didn't even like wave or like, oh, maybe we should go back and think about it. No, Samuel, yeah. well, we want a king. You ain't heresy. We want a king. We want to be like these other nations. And God said, okay, so you since you want to be like these other nations, that is your choice. I am humbly respecting your choice. Here you go. And yeah, bro, it's like like the whole the whole judges era, y'all. We could see it plain as day. I just don't know what it's like. Cause like sometimes when you out of the equation, you could see things clearer. But when you in mm. the equation, it, it might not be as apparent to you. But I think it's plain as day to see, especially the way that the, the writers of Judges script that wrote this together. Like y'all was serving God, everything was good. Y'all start serving idols, everything was not good. Y'all, someone rose up, get rid of the idols. Now everything good again. You know what I'm saying? That, bro. When we finished Judges, bro, it was like Israel was at the point of no return. But it was like Israel was seeing like such a dark place, bro. Like this evil people raping people. You understand what I'm saying? Like war, civil civil war against among the Israelites, mm-hmm. bro. That like, y'all almost destroy a whole tribe. Like it was just like, bro, what could possibly like 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 this is the worst it could get. And to think Samuel is after that. Mm-hmm. You understand? So we see, we see where things led up, where we have what it seems like um civ- civilization, like people being civilized. We we have somewhat peace because now the, the, the Philistines ain't bothering with them as long as Samuel is the leader. And so right now, y'all don't have nothing to worry about. And I think the, the thing really that they are worrying about is we just don't want to go back to them days. We remember how bad it was back in them days. And that's when we, we didn't have a king. And that's their, that's their thing. They and assuming, they, oh, go on. Well, go for it. Go for it. Finish. I think it was almost they, done. They assuming that the, the reason for all of their troubles was because they didn't have a king. But it was actually the fact that they rejected their king. That's the reason for their troubles. And again, too, like, I love what you just said too. Like, again, this is the same, this is the same Israel in that moral disconstruct that like it is so far. Like, as remember, we talked about when we first started this book too. We showed how Hophni and Phineas, how they were priests and how they were carrying on like priests. And we we're showing the morality, how far they have fallen. But again, the second part of that, the second part of that Israel had no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Mm-hmm. And we see in this, like, back to your point again. What is right in the one eyes is right now is saying we need a king. Mm. It's like the sentence builds upon itself in a weird loop. We're doing what is right now in our own eyes. And the only thing that's right now in our own eyes logically is we need a king. Mm. Like all the reasons you said is probably valid. Protection, all this other stuff. Like the crazy thing about it, if you take God out of the equation, which they're clearly doing, it's a logical argument. I cannot mm. lie. But we know that God was in their equation. And they're disregarding this variable in their equation. And this variable is the key to solving the answer. So now since they're removing this variable, they logically solve an equation, but it's like one of those, I sound like a real engineer right now, but it's like one of those equations that you can't solve because you're missing a variable. It's not like you're trying to solve this, but you're missing a very important piece. So you're not going to get the correct answer. And now we're seeing this is what is happening to the nation of Israel. Right. You're trying to solve this equation and you removed God from it and you're not going to get the right answer. Go for it. No, but see, my thing is like you say when you take out God, it like it's like it makes sense, bro. I don't fault them for that, you know, bro. <clears throat> if you look at Deuteronomy seventeen verse fourteen, it says, and this from the NIV: When you enter the land the Lord your God has given you, and you have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, "Let us set a king over us, like all the nations around us," be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. It does not say when you get in this land, do not set a king. So I don't know if this was because, you know, people like to say, oh, this was Moses 
talking or, or God talking. So I ain't gonna say who was talking there, but whoever this person was who was speaking, either Moses or God, they were saying, this is how you go about having a king. And so I, I am saying in God in his infinite wisdom, he knows there can come a time when they wanted a king. You understand what I'm saying? It's the right way and the wrong way to go about this. But at the end of the day, it's the reason why I all want a king is the master part. Y'all won't be like the other nations, bro. That's what costs y'all to be, but mm-hmm. everything, everything y'all worried about, not often protection, not going to war, but y'all only going to war because y'all was trying to be like the other nations, bro. If y'all wasn't trying to be like that, it wouldn't be no other nations, bro. The closest nation would have probably been somewhere far off like Egypt, bro, because you all destroy everyone who was in the land. Exactly. Exactly. From, from Genesis time, bro. The descendants of Ham, the Hittites, the Amorites. That's I, I think, if I remember correctly, all of these people was descendants of Ham, bro. It, bro, it was prophesied Ham was supposed to serve um, to, um, Shem and, 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 and his brothers and stuff like that. That was the curse of Noah, bro. But when y'all get in the line, y'all want to chill with them. These people was arousing God's anger for gener- bro, for, for before the 400 year period when the Israelites was in Egypt, God was already upset with them. We, we start off talking about the Ten Commandments, God visiting the iniquities of the third and the fourth and fifth and X, Y, Z generation mm-hmm. of those who hate him. The, and, and that commandment was directly talking about idols and graven images. So we know God say from this generation, they was worshiping idols and they keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. He prophesied to Moses. He said, bro, you're the are going into the land of Canaan, but not yet because my anger for the Amorites is not finished yet or something. He says mm-hmm. something along that line, right? And so it was destined for y'all to come and to rid the land of these people. In, in Deuteronomy, it says, do not think that the Lord is giving you, is telling you to kill these people because y'all are righteous, but it's because they are unrighteous. The same because y'all better than them. These people have it coming to them, whether y'all do it or whether God do it. It was coming. To himself. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? It was coming to them from, from the book of Genesis. It was coming. I think it's like Genesis 15 or 16. It's somewhere around there. Or maybe 11. But anyway, it was somewhere in the early Abraham, in the Abraham story. And so y'all trying to be like other nations is a snare to you all from um from Joshua, from the book of Joshua to the book of Judges, and now to the book of Samuel. And so we have now, you have the leader who is the high priest and the judge, Samuel. He, he saw the in his feelings. But God basically telling him, bro, this ain't, you straight, bro. This ain't even have nothing to do with you. This is a me thing. I should, I'm the one who should feel bad, because not bad, but I'm the one who is slighted in this, in this equation because... Mm-hmm. Everything they ask him for, I've already provided for them. And the only times I don't provide for them is when they're trying to be like other nations. And now they think in order to prevent themselves from, in order to make sure that they don't lock, we have to be like other nations so that we don't lock. But they miss, they missing it. They, because these people spiritually numb or spiritually blind, like they, they ain't understanding, bro. God is the answer. And, and that's every, that's all of us every day. This is every day. This is a now problem too, bro. A lot of people feel like I just need this job or I just need X, Y, Z. But when you think about it, you're like, well, wow, I have six figures, but for some reason, my needs always met already. Mercy. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But you don't want to rely on the way the Lord bless you. The Lord might bless you in this way. And you don't know where your next meal coming from, but the meal coming. You don't know how mm-hmm. you can get to work, but you get to work. You understand Every what I'm saying? <laughs> but you ain't into that because you want the car for yourself. I want to have my own car so I control where it happened because that fully relying on God thing, bro, it ain't it ain't comfortable. It's an uncomfortable thing because it takes a lot of faith. You walk by faith, not by sight. You need to see where these things coming from. You need to be, these things need to be tangible for us. I need to have a king. I need to see this guy, bro. I need to mm-hmm. see him in battle. I need to see him destroyed. That way I don't have to rely on faith. You know, that way I can rely on logic and, and these other things that are, are trackable and tangible. And so that's the that's the situation with Israel. Their lack of faith is being shown on the biggest stage now because they saying we need something we can see right now. And, and they saying this when everything good, because when everything bad is cry out to God, oh Lord, save me, do this and that and the third. But now that everything good, they say, all right, all right, all right. Let's prevent even being that low to where we have to rely on, on invisible God. Let's put a king in front of us so he could come, so and, he save can come us. and save us. The Lord declares that the Israelites have rejected him by requesting a king. 
And although Samuel already prophesied all of the consequences that will come with having a king, it appears that the hearts of the Israelites are already set. A king is what they want, and a king is what they'll get. But what happens when the king is from a clan that you least expect? We'll find out next week as we talk about Saul the Benjamite, king to be, on the next episode of A Breath of of Fresh Air. Tonight's episode included voice acting by your hosts, Earl Roberts and Nikaz Gay. Remember to go ahead and research on your own in order to get a more firm understanding of tonight's episode. And if you enjoyed it, make sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. You can follow us on social media at A Breath of Fresh Air Pod on Instagram and B O F A P O D on Twitter. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week.